I have an interview coming up with UFO researcher Richard Dolan. Here are some clips. We met with the guy at the DOD, but he's a whistleblower. All the information he revealed, well, none of it's classified or top secret. The, the, the kid who took the, innocently took a selfie uh, being inside the submarine, he's in prison. And this is the biggest thing ever, oh, no, even though it happened 15 I years ago. Here. I wouldn't say that Elizondo necessarily classifies as a whistleblower. I don't know. I mean, he, um, all of these people are self-serving. So the, the folks at TTSA, it's not like, you know, they're all angels and they have no other ulterior motives what they do. All these guys who are in the military, that was their pledge. Are we at a different point where we've totally given up on the idea that we need to hold these people accountable? Is that just kind of out the window? Oh, man, good question. We're, we are in a post-constitutional phase. I mean, look, we're in a, an upside-down world where what I, I call this thing now legal illegality. That's really what it is. It's like this legal um, framework to, to protect what is fundamentally should be illegal in any uh, democratic-oriented society. Consciousness clearly is important in some fundamental way to the uh, nature of our reality. And secondly, we have in, an enormous hole in our general understanding of reality itself. Like there's things we don't get. And so in that hole are things like UFOs. In that hole are things like, um, you know, synchronicities and spirituality and maybe even like, you know, definitely like psychic phenomena, psi phenomena absolutely fit in there. Stay with us for Skeptico. When it's all said and done, the UFO slash ET thing is going to be understood as, well, one of the biggest things in our history. I mean, it is, after all, at the center of just about every question we can ask. Who are we? Why are we here? And that makes it at the center of not just our history, but also the center of our science and maybe even the center of our spirituality. So if the UFO ET thing is the big thing, then what are we to make of today's guest? Because for the last 20 years, Oxford-trained historian and Rhodes Scholar finalist Richard Dolan has been widely acknowledged as one of the most respected, authoritative, and influential researchers within this field. His many books, I have some of them up on the screen if you're watching this, and his extensive research articles that I continue to profit from and lean on all the time have brought a new level of scholarship and, in particular, respectability to a field that really needed it, especially needed it a few years back when Richard started this adventure. He's the author of a number of books, as I mentioned, including the seminal UFO and the National Security State series. Also, uh, but another book we're going to talk about, one that he wrote with Bryce Zavel. And, uh, as you all know, Richard has appeared on many, many documentaries, TV programs. He's the host of the very excellent Richard Dolan show that we might play some clips of later in this interview. And it's just a real pleasure and joy to have him join me. Richard, thanks so much for being here. Alex, it's a pleasure. Thank you for that very nice introduction. It's nice to be here. Well, you're welcome. And I don't want to start off with a total cheese ball question, but this is going to maybe sound like one anyway. And that's, what are we to make of your legacy? And have you thought about your legacy? And that, you know, that makes it immediately sound like we're kind of putting you out to pasture or something. But I really want to hone in on this because, you know, the UFO field, anyone who's in that has to pretty much accept the fact that you are going to be ignored by all the mainstream praise givers, reward, rewarders, and honor giving entities, you're going to be outside of the loop on that. But as a historian, you know that sometimes history kind of straightens out those oversights. 
So without, I mean, you're a pretty modest guy from what I can tell, but have you given any thought to what it might look like in terms of your career in the longer lens of history? Interesting. I've actually never been asked that question before. <laughs> so, um, well, I have thought about and uh, whatever impact my contribution may have had to ufology in general. So when I think back on the um, publication of my first book, UFOs in the National Security State, and in the first edition of that book, I self-published back in the year 2000. That was about a year and a half before 9-11. And I do remember the reaction that it got from some of the old timers in the field at the time. And I, I was aware that it had a very, um, it seemed to have a strong impact for a lot of people because it was, um, I feel even now it was probably the first attempt to uh, sort of mainstream UFO history within a broader context of American and world history. So I don't think anyone had ever done that before. And that in itself at the time was kind of a radical thing. I could have done that book a lot better looking back on it. But um, the funny thing is writing that first book was my education in the field. I started in 1995, 94 at basically ground zero of knowledge of the subject. I knew nothing. So I, I started really throwing myself into the uh, old literature, the old books, Kehoe, Lorenzen's, Heineck, Ruppelt, all those guys, and every, everyone else that had been forgotten. And, um, and then a lot of the modern, what was then modern work on it and, and put together a narrative. Um, yeah, that, that had not really been done before. So I think, um, and there was, at the time, it was a radical interpretation of the UFO cover-up. Uh, I used the phrase national security state in the title itself, which actually I borrowed from an essay by Gore Vidal from the 1980s who had written an article like that, I think for the nation. But um, I think it was a radical interpretation of the cover-up, which when I look back on that book now, it seems very almost conservative in its uh, thesis. You know, <laughs> I think there have been, people have gone far, far more radical and uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a very uh, unproductive way. But I, I guess what I would say as far as legacy is that that work and then my subsequent volume and other work that I've done since have helped to open up, um, like, I'll, I guess I'll say a better political analysis of the UFO phenomenon and cover up. And, um, and then the, if there's any other legacy that I would have, uh, this isn't mine specifically, other people have done this as well or better for sure, but is to try to... Um, study this subject with, with respect, that is by um, looking at the data, not trying to pretend that I've understood all of the data and all of the information and uh, showing respect enough to the phenomenon self to have questions and to puzzle it out and not to pretend that I know everything. Uh, one thing that I, I just, I get frustrated by sometimes is by individuals in this field who, who act like they've got everything figured out. You know, that's interesting. Um, you know, the one thing I can really relate to having followed the UFO field kind of from the outside, especially when, when you got started, but was still super aware of the shift that came about with you doing things in the way that you did it, bringing this level of just confidence, authority, and scholarship. Did you, one more question on this, and then we're going to move on because I have so many things I want to talk to you about. But did you get a sense for that shift because I think a lot of people felt that shift, you know, Dolan comes out and he's hitting this stuff hard in terms of the, the real stuff, but he's doing it in a very matter of fact, scholarly way. We can handle this stuff. Boom. Here it is. Were you surprised by the shift? Did you notice the shift? I didn't notice it for a while. I have to honestly say that like, because I wasn't active in this field in the 1990s, I, I was a lone wolf researching this all through the nineties. No one knew who I was. So I didn't go to any conferences. I didn't really know anyone. I didn't talk to anyone. I had very limited correspondence. It's crazy when I look back how I did that book uh, over that five year period. Uh, so when I entered the field, I don't, I don't really think I had a, a true appreciation of how others were perceiving me. That's the truth. Like I could tell, that there were individuals who told me that they appreciated what I did. And I mean, I got that early on and that, that has grown over the years, certainly in the last 
decade, even 15 years, it's been, um, it's been shocking to me, to be honest, to, to see the response that people get from me. I'm, it's humbling, I'll, I'll honestly say. But in the early years, um, I, no, I don't think, I can't say that I was really aware. I, I think that I was, I was very focused on, um, on pursuing what I felt was um, a, an original approach to this, at least as far as I could tell. And um, I know it's a hard question to answer. <laughs> I think over, over time, I've come to appreciate that, that, my, that whatever it is that I've done has had its own niche, its own place in ufology. And, and that's, that's definitely a good feeling. So one of the things that you've done, I guess, is really give us a, a reorientation to the word disclosure and what that means. And you've kind of come back to that again and again. And when we chatted before the interview, one of the things that I said I really was anxious to talk to you about was kind of a follow-up to a book that you published a few years ago after Disclosure, which I thought at the time was, again, is such a, <laughs> I'm going to stop singing your praises here in a minute because it's getting uncomfortable, but it, it really was a novel way to kind of deal with the question of how can there be this reality that seems to be acknowledged by so many people and understood by so many people, and yet it's cut under wraps, and we keep spinning around in that circle, and then somebody jumps ahead and says, okay, wait a minute, let's say what happens after disclosure. So anyways, that's what the book was about. Many people oh, will yeah. know about that book. But then I found a fantastic presentation you did, The New Face of Disclosure, and the YouTube video is up. You gave it in Copenhagen in July of 2019. And back to the pre-interview thing we were having, I wanted to ask you, what you think now, now that a lot of us would look around and say disclosure has happened or is happening, what do you think about disclosure now? Let me play a clip from your sure. presentation and then let's chat about that a little bit. So can the establishment truly dominate the narrative if they are rolling out this disclosure narrative? I think it would be very difficult or anyone who's trying to control the narrative really. Uh, there's a lot of questions that will come up. You know, when, when we did uh, After Disclosure 10 years ago, Bryce and I really asked about these things. For me, the big question is, if you make an acknowledgement that UFOs are real, ever, then wouldn't it be the case that people would say, oh my God, so how have you been lying to us all this time? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. I mean, that's enough of a tee up right there. Just, what do you think? Well, um, first thing I'll just say is it's funny about disclosure. I did not ever want to write about disclosure, ever. Uh, 15 plus years ago, people were talking about disclosure. This is back in 2002, two, three, four, And I would say, ah, way too early to talk about that. We still have to uh, get into the nature of the cover-up and disclosure is premature. And, but the problem is I kept getting roped in to uh, – Steve Bassett's X conferences, which were about disclosure, and all these other disclosure conversations, I was naturally brought in because of the political analysis that I used to do, that I've always done. So uh, yeah, when, when we wrote After Disclosure, um, that's a book I, I'm really happy I had a great co-author. Bryce Abel was uh, and is a script screenwriter, producer. He's got a lot of good Hollywood experience. He did the TV show Dark Skies, which many still remember. And uh, his imprint is really definitely visible on that book. But in terms of what I'm, I was talking about in that clip there in Copenhagen, I, I still maintain this. I've always believed that any kind of official announcement from any government body, particularly the United States government, is going to be a really difficult one for them to control. Um, because the UFOs, people think they can tame this subject, and it, and it cannot be tamed. It's it's too big of a reality transformation. And that is why I actually don't believe that we're, we're seeing disclosure right now. When, when uh, the mainstream narrative changed starting at the end of 2017, when the New York Times did their few pieces, Politico, and then all of the follow-up, and we have seen so much transformation, uh, it is easy to come to the conclusion, oh, well, this is 
completely government controlled. It's a psyop. It's a disclosure narrative, whatever. I know you really pushed back hard on me when we were talking and I said, Richard, to me, this is obviously a political psyop kind of disclosure because it's coming from, you totally disagree. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, well, I I can understand the point of view, but here's, I'll tell you why I disagree. Um, Can can I, can I, can I ask you to pause that? Let me add a clip to it and and then you can respond directly because we both uh, like, uh, I think you, know and appreciate Leslie Kane, right? Mm. Who, of course, and has the byline to that New York Times story. And I had a chance to interview her. And uh, I love Leslie. She's awesome. She's been on the show a couple times. I have a lot of respect for her, but I hammered her pretty hard. Let me play this clip. Yeah. Leslie, who comes forward? This is not a day. He's not a whistleblower, right? This is Yeah, he kind of is. You are such a good journalist, writer, investigative journalist beyond I have this two group colleagues, here. two colleagues but, at the Times that have, are even more experienced than I am that were in, in on this with me. So but, not just, but just me. looking at it from, a, from the big picture, where is an example of A, where anyone inside the government has come out and said anything even like this? I mean, the, the kid who went to jail for having a picture of a submarine in his background. I mean, this is not a day and age where people inside the government with deep state secrets like this are allowed to speak freely. He was not breaking boundaries or saying all this crazy stuff that no one wanted him to say. This is a controlled release. No, I don't agree with that. I mean, none of our work ever led me to get to that conclusion or any of us. And we talked to a lot of people. The point is, none of the information that he brought forward was classified information. Is about classified information. That's the distinction. Right. That distinction is, is meaningless at this point. This is the biggest story probably in, in, the, in, our, in the history of our lives, certainly. A lot of people are saying in the history of the world. And to suggest that this somehow and some phony baloney, classified, not classified, top secret, this isn't classified, and that's supposed to be the, the, the mark, I, I don't see it. Okay, so of course the he <laughs> we're talking about is Lou Elizondo. And what do you make of that? You know, this thing that, oh, this wasn't classified, so that's why it came out. So funny, I find myself agreeing with Leslie on this issue. Um, I mean, I've known Leslie for many years and and like and respect her. And and we've, I just chatted with her again last summer. But I haven't always agreed with her uh, perspective on public or public statements on this. But I agree with her here. Um, Although I didn't probably initially agree. So um, I'll tell you why I would agree with you. I would agree with you because uh, perhaps like you, I, I don't have a trust of the New York Times and I don't have a trust of any of the um, mainstream corporate journalist media establishment that exists in the Western world. I think all of it is hopelessly corrupt and servants of the national security apparatus and the global financial apparatus. So anything that comes out of the New York Times, I think you have to be very, very careful of. and. And, you know, considering that the New York Times had 75 years or so of consistent anti-UFO, I mean, the worst snarky, smarmy, only exceeded by the Washington Post, probably, which is which is actually the worst. But the New York Times has been so bad on this. And then suddenly, boom, what's this all about? So I'm going to give you my take on what happened here. All right. You can really lay this at the doorstep of the folks at TTSA. Now, we can talk about what we think TTSA is. You can- Yes, we will. Say, oh, they're a CIA op. Um, but let, let's just leave that aside for a moment and we'll, let's put a pin in that, as I say. So TTSA rolls out their press conference in October of 2017. And as you'll probably remember, that's where really the first public statement of what became known as the Tic Tac UFO, even though that had been in- that had been discussed and above top secret, all of that. But really, you have these guys talking about it. And it's a heck of an encounter. And they're talking also about ATIP in that October press release. I'm not sure if they used the name ATIP, but they certainly said the Pentagon's been studying this. So it was actually that TTSA press conference that outed the Tic Tac and the ATIP program. So now you've got... Um, a legit journalist like Leslie, who is legit interested in UFOs, not pretend, but she's genuinely interested. And she's got her inroads with the New York Times. 
and she's got a couple of allies there, Blumenthal and Helene Cooper, and they're dealing with a New York Times establishment that does not want to cover this. But I asked Leslie about this myself last summer, and she didn't give me an answer as to why the New York Times covered this. But I'm going to give you my answer as to why. I believe the New York Times covered this because they knew that this story was going to break. And I believe that they said, all right, we will we'll do this, but we're going to handle it our way. And what they ended up doing, if you look at those articles, is they brought in, uh, particularly with the ATIP piece, uh, ridiculous uh, skeptical statements that had no meaning, like by James Oberg, Oberg like what is he even doing in this article? And this uh, meaningless astronomer from, I think, Yale or Harvard, who had zero to say about this. But these were skeptical placeholders, psychological placeholders. So what the New York Times did is basically their attempt to control this narrative so that not to let it get out of control. What happened is that because the New York Times gave even some validation to UFOs, I think this became much bigger than the leadership at the Times would have expected. Boy, I, I just, <laughs> we, will, we, will, we will have to disagree on this and, and we'll, we'll move well, on. Let's explore things, it. Like let's, I, I'd hey, like do, to have this out. Do, okay. And it, just to address the point, I mean, to me, it's so patently just ludicrous. And, and you know, the other thing I always like to add. Well, to people, what's ludicrous? What's ludicrous exactly? First of all, the idea that Lou Elizondo is a whistleblower is just, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't well, I, pass I wouldn't the necessarily test. call him a whistleblower. I think that's But she a just idea. did. She just did. Well, she said he's a whistleblower. And, and, and then the idea that we met, we met with the guy at the DOD, but he's a whistleblower. All the information he, re, he revealed, well, none of it's classified or top secret. It's like, I'm, like I mentioned, you know, the, the, the kid who took a, innocently took a snap photo, a uh, selfie, uh, being inside the submarine. He's in prison, and this is the biggest thing ever, oh, even though it happened 15 I, I years ago. Here. I wouldn't say that Elizondo necessarily classifies as a whistleblower. I don't know. I mean, he, um, all of these people are self-serving. So the, the folks at TTSA, it's not like, you know, they're all angels and they have no other ulterior motives for what they do. Uh, it's all about money. It's all about getting a piece of the action. I, I would hazard to guess that they want, maybe they want some defense money. Maybe they want some contracts. Maybe they want access to what they know is classified technology. There, there may be other things going on here where uh, it's not all philanthropic. I, I would be shocked if it were. Who, whoever acts like that. Um, so I don't I mean, know if here's I would call the it Here's the alternative read on that, mm -hmm. that, that I take and a lot of other people take is that number one it's political the word political is important here not because i have any political stake in the left versus the right i think the whole thing is is a scripted nonsensical joke at this medium level and that there's a layer above it that just ignores all that anyway but this is clearly coming from the podesta clinton camp that was trying to release the year before it sure looks they were hooked up with Tom DeLonge and that whole thing. And they were announcing, they were kind of preheating us for the release. They didn't win the election. So they just kind of rolled it out anyway, is how it looked to me. I think yeah. the whole, the no. whole thing, the whole Peter Lavenda, Tom DeLonge thing, it just right. was, the story just never made any sense. Peter Lavenda, well, you know, Tom DeLonge called me up and I was like, wow, is this really Tom DeLonge? He's like, yeah, buddy, we got to go to the CIA and get to the bottom of the UFO story because it's never been told. It's like, are, are, is this like some kind of bad script? I think, or I think there's, there's some reality and some, some non-reality in that. So I would say uh, I've never believed that Hillary and Podesta were ever going to be a disclosure team, ever. I don't, I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. I don't think it would ever have happened. If she had been elected president, there would be no more disclosure than there is now. I don't think that was a plan. I do believe Podesta is very smart. And as a UFO savvy guy, which he clearly is, um, recognized that his candidate, who was desperately in need of an additional cool factor in her campaign, could benefit from being kind of a UFO, knowing also that the New York Times would not trash her since they basically own the New York Times coverage anyway. So she, she could get away with being a UFO candidate, go on Jimmy Kimmel, you know, try her hand at that whole thing, uh, and maybe win a few votes. That's all that I've ever believed. There's no evidence to me that in any of the DeLong 
Podesta communications that Podesta was actually serious about this. Like someone, please show me where, where does Podesta show that? Yes, we're going to do disclosure. This is all DeLong, all his thing. Uh, Podesta allowed some communications to happen. And then of course the whole thing was they turned the lights on. WikiLeaks came out and they all ran for cover and, and uh, DeLong came up with his B team. But uh, well, that's, that's one this reason. Is a Hillary thing. I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I don't think I believe that. Okay. I think I mean, that they were, I think uh, DeLong's people might have had these, had these illusions. Yes, I think that's entirely possible, that they would have thought, oh, yes, we're going to get Hillary and Podesta to be disclosure candidates. Um, but I well, seriously doubt that Hillary Clinton or Podesta would have considered moving ahead with a UFO disclosure. Well, one of the things that people really appreciate about your work, Richard, and I respect as well, is you move very carefully according to direct evidence that you have. Or you, or we can't really say direct evidence, but as close as you can get to direct Try. evidence. Try. And I respect that. Try. At the, at the same time, I think, I think there is a need to kind of fill in some of these blanks, and that's what I'm trying to do here as well. But let's move on to... Uh, kind of a related. Well, I, I enjoyed point. this. I just want, I, I enjoyed uh, discussing this with you. So. Well, when I listened to your Copenhagen presentation, I kind of think you're in many respects in the same camp when you lay out really the 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 like you say the WAP. The Washington Post and his appearance on Fox, that is Lou Elizondo, and then all this other stuff. You kind of make the case on both sides, and then you come down on one or the other, which is totally, I get respect. Here's something that we're going to move on to. What you dubbed okay. the leak of the century. Yes. And we're going to talk about that, but we're going to, and that is the, the release by of the Thomas Wilson memo. But I'm going to do it through the words of this guy who we see up on the screen, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo astronaut, support our troop, Dr. Edgar Mitchell. Let me play a, a couple of clips from this, and I might have to skip around because it's a long clip, but I want to get a couple of things in there. So first, I thought we'd just play a little bit of the yeah, intro because the up. guy is so, you know. I will now call to the podium uh, of uh, a distinguished American, a, a man who uh, is, in fact, someone who has the right stuff which includes uh, a doctorate in aeronautics and astronautics from MIT, selection to the NASA Apollo program, selection to a NASA Apollo So Bassett's going to go through mission. his long list yeah. of accomplishments, <laughs> which, which he should and he deserves, Dangerous. but we're going to skip ahead here a little bit. This, now he's going to be talking about relatives and friends. Some of the people in the uh, area who had been involved, what I call the old timers, because I'll just add in here, uh, Edgar Mitchell is from Texas, but he really claims to be from Roswell because he moved there yes. at a very young age. And uh, people like in the Sheriff's Department who have been to the crash site and were supervising traffic. Uh, my friend and friend of our family, the Major, who was... An office mate. So because he does have a little bit of that Texas draw and you're a New Yorker and I'm a Chicago guy, we need a little bit of speed up here. He basically says, and, and I want you to respond to this, you know, any yes. doubters about Roswell should be doubters no more. Our Apollo astronaut walked on the moon 2009. He comes and says, hey, it's real. I know it from the best authorities that I have and I'm a local and I know it and it also jives with what I know from my professional career. So that we're going to put a pin in that, but I do want you to come back to address it. Yes. And I wanted to bring, go forward a little bit in this conversation to the real point of what I was trying to uh, get you to respond to here. Let's okay. see if I can get that. And uh, at some point about 10 years ago, and I can't remember what date it was right now, when the disclosure movement was under <clears throat> going strongly, I came here to Washington with a Navy commander by the name of Will, Will Miller and Dr. Stephen Greer, and we have, were able to get an appointment at the Pentagon to talk about what we knew, or what we allegedly knew, what we thought we knew, and went and told our story. And uh, the powers that be at the Intelligence Committee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff listened to our story. 
and said, the uh, admiral said, well, I don't know that story. I don't know that that's true, but I will find out. So we departed. Okay, bring him Whatever. down because I want you to pick up and you've written extensively and done some extensive shows on this. And yeah. again, you dubbed it the what leak did you say ufo leak of the century so fill people in a century. little bit and tell us what edgar mitchell's talking about absolutely i'm glad you found that clip by the way alex i was sitting in that audience looking at him when he did that and uh, it's funny how i forgot this is 2009 that was yeah uh yeah but anyway um i've known about this since 2006 so um and in fact i communicated with Edgar about that in back in 06 as well. But essentially, here's, here's the story. Back in 1997, April of that year, uh, Edgar Mitchell, Commander Will Miller, who we just mentioned, Dr. Stephen Greer, a couple of other people. Uh, Greer was really leading this effort at the time to make the rounds in Washington to uh, talk to anyone within Congress, anyone in power about the UFO cover-up issue and, and his particular take uh, largely accurate, I would have to say, on the black budget uh, nature of the UFO cover-up, the privatization, the rogue nature of the secrecy, as I think he would call it, and I would call it. So, um, and, and, and let me just interject here, because yeah. I want you to break that down for people, because I, I've listened to like two hours that you've given on that, and it's spellbinding in terms of these secret programs, the, the different levels of authorization, non-authorization, knowledge outside, and then the privatization yes. thing and the, it's, it's really a ploy to move it outside of the purview of the Freedom of Information right. Act. So exactly. just kind of at a high level, go over that game that's being played because well, that yeah. fits into this. Well, I'll, uh, let me, I'll continue by just by, by telling the story, but I, I will definitely want to bring that analytic in because it's important. When it ended up happening, and, and everyone has agreed to this, that, that uh, Greer and his group were able to meet with Admiral Thomas R. Wilson, who at the time was uh, vice chair of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the position known as J-2. Uh, very shortly after that, Wilson became head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs, and then uh, within two years of that, became head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, then retired, went off into private industry in the uh, early Bush years. But here we are in 97, and Greer um, actually did a presentation for Wilson and Wilson's colleagues, and, and one of Wilson's bosses and other colleagues were there. And uh, it was all about UFOs. In fact, one of the things mentioned was Philip J. Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. So UFO crashes. Um, so all of that is official. In 2006, someone very close to all of that but not at the meeting, but someone close to Mitchell, someone close to that whole group, um, met with me personally and we uh, and showed me a couple of pages. And I, I've never remembered if it's two or three pages. It's one or the other. It might be two pages, it might be three pages of what looked like a transcript of sorts. It turned out to be Eric Davis's notes. Uh, but a transcript between uh, of one person writing down his interview with someone else, and this individual that I was speaking with told me, yeah, uh, this person was in the uh, Joint Chiefs and met with Greer and was told about the black budget program of UFOs and went looking and uh, within two months was uh, found the program or one of the programs and then was denied access by the lawyers, by the corporate lawyer and the program manager because he didn't have a need to know and was very upset about it. So, um, and then the other thing was that he got a, that I remembered reading is that he had confirmation that this was technology, not of this earth, not made by human hands. Um, I wasn't given any names during that meeting, but shortly after that, I read Stephen Greer's book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, where he wrote about his meeting with Wilson. And I wrote back to my contact. I said, oh, I guess I know who it is. It's Wilson. And he said, yep. Uh, ended up having a quick phone conversation with Admiral Wilson I communicated with Edgar Mitchell about this. I even communicated with uh, Stephen Greer briefly. Um, and long story short, Wilson would not admit whatsoever, first that he even had the meeting, then he was forced to admit he had the meeting, uh, and then said, no, but I never did anything after that. I never looked into it, I thought it was nonsense, which is patently untrue. And here's, you have Mitchell's statement saying that 
that uh, Wilson did look into it. Of course, we don't really know, like no one literally would know, but what we do have is Eric Davis of National Institute of Discovery Science, who was friendly with Edgar Mitchell. They were all on the NIDS board back in those days, run by Robert Bigelow. The head of the board was Kit Green. Uh, another important member was Hal Puttoff, Colm Kelleher, all of these people. They all knew each other. And what I always call them is Bigelow's club. They are the people trying to work their way into the labyrinth. They all had their own security clearances to one extent or another. They all knew a lot about UFOs. They all shared what they could share on this matter. And they did it for years. And they still do to the extent that they can. So, so here in 2002, Davis has an opportunity to meet with Wilson. Uh, or is it 2003? 2003, excuse me. He has an opportunity to meet with Wilson. And he goes, and it's an, roughly an hour or so long meeting, and it's in a car, and Davis either had recorded it or wrote these notes down and brings it back to the crew, back to Green, back to Puttoff, back to Bigelow, back to Mitchell. And, and when Mitchell died, in, in uh, it was 2017, his papers uh, mostly were taken by his family, like his Apollo stuff and all of that. But the papers that had to do with NIDS, the papers that had to do with consciousness, that had to do with UFOs, um, they were going to be destroyed. And uh, the family had no interest in it. But one individual, and I I've, I've, actually don't know the person's full name anyway, so it's no point. But I know about this person. Uh, was able, allowed legally to take a certain amount of these papers out of the house. And they have, some of them have been JPEGged. And one of those papers are the Eric Davis notes that, you know, were about his meeting with Thomas Wilson that confirm things like MJ-12, that confirm the deep privatization of the UFO secret, which we can get into, that confirm Wilson's utter frustration at attempting and failing to get into this black budget uh, world of special access program, reverse engineering, UFO tech, and uh, maybe even ET bodies, although that didn't come up in the, the notes. So all of that. And I am personally waiting for more of these notes to come out. I know that there are more. I don't know if they're bombshells. I don't know if they're duds, but I know that there's more. And I think I'm hopeful that there will be more of these that come out. Now, relating to UFO privatization, I'll, I'll simply... Well, well, before you get into that, let me oh, just yeah, jump yeah. in there. Because one thing I want to say, are you a little bit too comfortable with that? Have you been desensitized to that a little bit, Richard? Because here's <laughs> my point. You know, you've done an awesome job. So this has now reached the Dolan level of credibility, which you already have told us is pretty high. You need the sources. You need the documents, you know. And now you have the documents. You say AD, after disclosure, are we after constitution? Oh, when yeah. we have these high level people it disclosing <laughs> that, you know, this support and defend the constitution against all powers, foreign and domestic, which is what everyone pledges. All these guys who are the military, that was their pledge. Edgar mm -hmm. Mitchell, that was his pledge. And you can say he's a good guy or he didn't disclose enough, but that was his pledge. Wilson, yes. that was his pledge. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing it. And, you know, are we at a different point where we've totally given up on the idea that we need to hold these people accountable? Is that just kind of out the window? Oh, man, good question. We're, we are in a post-constitutional phase. I mean, look, we're in a, an upside-down world where what I, I call this thing now legal illegality. That's really what it is. It's like this legal um, framework to, to protect what is fundamentally should be illegal in any uh, democratic-oriented society. So should that's we? Huge. That's huge. Yeah. Say that again. I mean, that's why I say, illegal, you know, you're awesome, but some Legal illegality, yeah, yeah. The calmness, illegal. the calmness that you bring to that, the poli side calmness, you know, it doesn't fully bring people into what you're saying about this point we are in this thing we call the United States. I mean, we're talking about really uh, jumping past. Maybe uh, I have been desensitized. I've been talking about this for 20 years. I mean, since 9-11. I got into a lot of trouble... Uh, 
to some, at least over my 9-11 comments. That's a whole other episode, perhaps. But I've been, I've been on the other side of this for a long time. And I've, I don't think I've been under an illusion that we have a, a truly functioning democratic Republican system. I hold on to the dream of that because what else can I hold on to? <laughs> we, what we're living in is a world of 24-7 global fascistic type of surveillance that in which no one will ever have an inkling of privacy ever again for the rest of our lifetimes and our grandchildren's lifetimes. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around that. So that's a whole other thing. So we're, we're living in a completely different world than what we were taught in our fifth grade civics class of what American life is supposed to be. And that goes for any country. But in terms of the secrecy of UFOs, it's so, it is so profound. It's so deep. So for example, when uh, this whole leak came out, all right, I wrote, um, I got a, I got a no comment from Hal Put Off and I got a no comment a month later from Kit Green. And I'm just going to say like, I know both of these guys reasonably well, particularly Put Off I've known for years. And, uh, I just said, you know, look, why don't, why doesn't your group come out and own these documents? Because you know, they're real, you know, it's the real deal just for posterity. You're all getting up there. Like, what are you hanging on to? Why are you doing this? And, you know, all of them, it's not just, it's not just him. It's all of them. They're all in this world of clearances and they are terrified of losing their clearances all of them every last one they um they don't want to acknowledge and and the funny thing about this particular document is this is eric davis's private notes the document itself is not a classified government document it's a private document about a classified program and legally there's nothing classified about that document like there's no reason that it should have to be classified. It's a private document written by Eric Davis about a meeting he had with someone about a classified subject. And yet they still won't own it because it will reflect badly on them and they don't want to lose the clearances that they've had. I spoke to someone in that, in that crowd a number of years ago who told me explicitly about their knowledge of deep black programs that have alien tech and alien bodies. And and they, this person said, yeah, and what, what do I do with this information? He said, what if I told you that I know the names of like the top 10, 12, 15 people who are most in on this secret? And, and uh, I leak that information. Let's say I leak it to the New York, New York Times. A, what would the New York Times do with it? Probably nothing. But if the New York Times were to publish it, it would very likely be traced back to me and I would lose all of my clearances and then I'm out of the game. And so that's the game all these people are playing. Now, then there's threats. I wrote to Mitchell on one occasion about this. Uh, I was writing to Edgar Mitchell a lot in 06, 07, 08. And uh, I said, look, you know, you told me personally one time, and Mitchell did in 04, he told me alone in a room, he said he had two individuals at the highest level clearances who confirmed to him the existence of alien bodies and ET tech being held. Mitchell said this to me in 2004, and he made this statement once or twice publicly, but he said it to me, and I wrote to him a few years later and I said, look, you tell me you like my work, so why don't you throw me a bone and point me in a direction that can help me? I'm not asking you to give up anyone, but can you just give me something? And, and what he wrote back was kind of amazing. He said, look, I support what you do. However, the people who came to me did who gave me this information did so at great risk he said professionally personally and risk to their families and i will not essentially he will not throw them under the bus while they were still alive and he never did so risk to their families you know you fill in the blank what that means but uh these people there's carrot and stick for them both like the carrot is you play ball you're a team player it's like being in goodfellas like you're a made man you get you get all of these nice little openings in your career for you. If you do not play ball, they bring the hammer down. And however hard, one of them also said this to me, all right, I'm not giving up names. When I cannot give up a name, I will not give up a name. But one of them said, a lot of these programs do not require you to sign an NDA or security. Like he says, look, when you get into these programs, you 
No, you don't talk about it. End of blood story. in, blood out. That's <laughs> just yeah, like it's a game. like the mafia. Yeah. Like the mafia. Yeah. So, yeah. But anyway, the privatization, I'll just leave you with this. Um, uh, there was a very good article I was led to early on in my research, like 01, 02, by a fellow named Bill Sweetman, who is an aviation writer. I don't know if he's still around. He um, did a lot of work with Jim Goodall. Um, on like stealth technology, not UFO so much, really just uh, advanced aerospace aviation uh, work. Sweetman's a really good writer. He wrote on the Aurora craft. He wrote on the stealth fighter, stealth bomber, a lot of other, he's a real Area 51 expert. And he wrote this article for Jane's International Defense in uh, 2000, early 2000, on, I forget the name of it, Black Budget Special Access Programs. And it was a good analysis for a mainstream journalist, for sure. And he talked about how the SAP world is dominated, was even then, by private money, not by DOD personnel. He said, when I looked into this, to my surprise, I found that this is a totally privatized and all the security clearances are, are held in private industry. And, you know, 10 years later, the Washington Post, of all publications, did a study called, uh, I think, America Top Secret. Uh, Dana Miller, Bill Arkin did that. Similar conclusions. Uh, just last summer, I'm talking with Kit Green about this, and he, he says, absolutely, it's all, when you retire from the CIA or any federal group and you go into private industry, your clearances go up and they become better and more numerous. He said, because that's where the brain power is, that's where the money is, that's where the power is. The federal government, in other words, is just holding the ball for these guys. And your tax dollars, my tax dollars, pay for the security of these privatized programs to make shitloads of money, if I could say that on your show. If not, you'll have to edit me out. Um, to, save, to make a lot of money off of exotic technology, some of which I think has been acquired by, <laughs> through uh, not our own work. So, um, well, we had, we had Diana Walsh Pasolka on and you know, her book, American oh, yes. Cosmic. Right. I mean, she just directly lays it out. You know, here it is. Here's the here's the secret college. You know, where right. stuff is brought in. Here's the privatized Silicon Valley guys, and there's just no reason to believe that isn't true. No, and, she and got also, dipped right into that uh, very, very like, very and in a weird way too, because we're going to come yeah. back and swing about that because the spirituality part. You know, she kind of gets mm -hmm. into, too, with the Catholic Church right. and all that. But I, I just wanted to close the loop on what you just said, because the the privatization, first and foremost, it's an end run on the Constitution, right? Exactly. I mean, that, that's really what it's that, about. That's, that's exactly it. So, so you have a, a, I mean, this is something that's been going on since the bullet went through Abraham Lincoln's brain in 1865. If you really want to go back through American true. history, this has been going on since that moment. And um, and it's just one degree after another after another, and we're now in this upside down world where. But and and it's like um, in my very first book, I I brought in a quote by Niccolo Machiavelli from his Discourses on Livy. It's a good book, it's a great book, and he essentially said, "Look, if you really want to have a a, a functioning revolution, like a revolution from above, he says the way to do it is you've got to retain." A semblance of the old forms, because that's all people notice. That's all that they're used to. So uh, it says if you, you can change the fundamental structure of something, but if you keep the exterior looking the same way, people will almost inevitably go along. And that's what's exactly happened here. So we've got, we still have presidents, we still have Supreme Court, we still have uh, two houses of Congress. Uh, we have this system in place, but the body's kind of dead. And it's like in that movie Alien where the thing comes out of the chest. So you've got this corpse and this new thing has come out. Uh, I called it the national security state. You can call it the deep state. You can call it the global financial system. I mean, it's something that is standing behind and much more powerful than our official political institutions. And how to get control back in the name of the people is really our single most important thing. And, and, uh, Relating to UFOs, I mean, it's a fascinating subject on every level to me, philosophically, scientifically, absolutely. But to me, the most important thing is politically because um, I'm not interested in a world where dis disclosure happens to me 
uh, in a completely controlled manner by our social betters and our political betters. Like I have no interest in that. I'll just put me in a rocket ship and I'll live on the moon. I don't wanna live on this world. Um, I'm interested in, in getting to some level of truth so that citizens can at least have a dream of some level of sovereignty. And I think the UFO secret has, has seriously moved us. Um, it's not the only thing that's created this, this world that we live in of uh, a privatized secrecy and legal illegality, but it's de definitely contributed a lot. And, and political science people to this day don't appreciate just how important it has been in creating that world. I want to move on. I want to talk about mm -hmm. good ET, bad ET. Because one of the things I also really respect about your work, Richard, is I feel like even though the political side, the national security side is your swing zone, you've allowed yourself to be stretched in some really important ways. And you seem willing, and I'm just surprised at how many people are unwilling to go over that next hill, be it consciousness, be it spirituality, be it your unbelievable four-part interview series, and maybe even grow beyond that with Chris Bledsoe, where he's talking about angels, and we're going to play a clip from that. So you and your wife, Tracy, who is an experiencer, I don't know, does she call herself a, an experiencer or an abductee? I mean, that's something we can even pull apart. I think she would probably say experiencer. I would think that's her go-to. Okay. She doesn't, she wouldn't say that she knows she's an abductee. So I would say that she, she does, she does believe strongly that she's had a couple of experiences with non-human intelligences. Well, you guys did an incredible YouTube video on this that is like 80,000 views and is just incredible in terms of its breadth and covering a lot of these topics. But there's some I wanted to drill in further. And I thought this would be a, a time to do it. And I think it also pairs up well with, as I was saying, the recent series you've done with Chris Bledsoe. Here's a guy we both know and like, respect, Grant Cameron. He's been on my show a couple of times. I know you're friends with him. Let me play this clip from Grant and then let's talk about that. His wife suddenly wants to talk about, I'd like to talk about entanglement, particle oh. entanglement. And I'm thinking, why would you ask us? Your husband is a PhD in physics. He's run, he run the parapsychology, the, um, the, the, what they call the phenomenology desk at the, the CIA. Weird, the weird what, desk, yeah. The weird desk. And what people have to realize is that when the CIA calls it phenomenology, that is a hint as to what's going on. It is not UFOs. It's remote viewing, ghosts, parapsychology, uh, the telepathy. It's the whole ball of wax because it's all consciousness. That's the ground of being. It's consciousness. And they know that. And that's why... When the Canadian government document said in 1950 that mental phenomena may be involved, the top secret Canadian government document said mental phenomena may be involved in flying saucers. That's when they started the MK Ultra stuff. Hmm. That's when they started all that because they were trying to figure out how does consciousness work because they had a live alien in 1947. That's how the Americans knew to tell the Canadians in 1950 that mental phenomena was involved. Nobody was talking to aliens in 1950. There were, Adamski and Williamson would not come forward until a couple of days after the detonation of the hydrogen bomb. Betty and Barney Hill would not become public until the mid-60s. Nobody said they were talking to aliens, in public at least. And so therefore, how did they know that mental phenomena was involved? Because they had a live alien. And they knew that the alien talked is telepathic and it gets in your head. And they went, wow, man, if we could discover how this worked. And so Now, yeah. I know you're a New Yorker and you talk fast, but no one talks as fast. He's <laughs> in a class by himself. And he's out in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Yes. How does he do that? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, yeah. Where do you get that from? You know, the, we don't, we don't quite get that. Grant, Here's Grant gets. Well, I just want to give Grant credit because, as far as I know, he is the first person really to key in on the significance of that phrase, mental phenomena, in the Wilbert Smith memo that he wrote to the Canadian uh, Department of Transport way back in 1950. Yes. Uh, you know, we looked at other people have looked at other parts of that memo for years. Yes. Uh, that the subject's more important than the H bomb and so forth, but Grant. Grant keyed in uh, below that where this aspect of mental phenomena 
was was very considered very important by the U.S. government. And, and he uses that to catapult us into a whole bunch of stuff that jumps us right into the middle of this good yeah. ET, bad ET. You know, Richard, my my approach to this whole thing, the whole skeptical approach, has been from consciousness. That's what I was interested in answering for myself. You know, who are we? Why are we here? Well, let's look at what people are saying about consciousness. Let's look at near-death experience. Let's look at out-of-body experience, after-death communication, parapsychology. You know, you look at the first 200 interviews I did. That's what was with Dean Radin, Rupert Sheldrick, parapsychology oh, people, right. Dr. Julie Goschel. So it was interesting when I met Grant and synced in, I I think I was influential to Grant in saying, do you understand the, how consciousness, ah. how we are, how we are being part of the conspiracy is this idea that science continues to tell us we're biological robots in a meaningless universe while at the same time acting like we were just saying in the kind of secret legal Ill, Ill, illegality way. They're doing Stargate. They're doing men who stare at goats. They're way beyond consciousness as an illusion, as an epiphenomenon of the brain. And then Grant, like you said, puts in the missing puzzle piece and goes, yeah, that's because in the 1950s they knew it. And then that makes us rethink the whole MK Ultra thing and what our orientation is to evil because there's clearly evil in MK Ultra where we're trying to wipe people's minds clean and reprogram them and all this other stuff. Yeah. So jump us into what has been your, I guess, process of getting into these deeper questions and because it also gets into spirituality very very yeah. quickly and, and as as i already hinted at and you jumped in both feet with chris bledsoe so there i've, I've laid like fifty thousand things oh on let's you. let's do it so i'm i um and by the way i don't know what time limit you have but i i'm really enjoying this so i'll go as long as you want to go i'm having a great time here i will start by telling a story that i have told once in a while but not that often and for me, it was a defining moment in my life. I was, I think, 20 or 21 years old at the time. Um, and, you know, I've always thought about these types of issues of free will and determinism and spirituality. And I, I, I think a lot of people have. I'm one who's always thought about it. And I went through a very strong period where I was, uh, I guess I was an atheist. I was 19, 20 years old. Um, and I had my reasons all laid out as to why I did not believe in any kind of transcendental reality. I thought that was all based on wish fulfillment. Um, I just started reading Freud, I remembered, and a lot of other philosophers and existentialists, you know how it is. And I thought, well, that's all just, uh, you know, we believe in an afterlife because we're afraid of death and, and we don't want to come to terms. So, and then I, I had a dog and I was feeding my dog. Uh, I can see this in my mind even now. So I've got a can of dog food out and I'm opening up the can and he knows exactly what I'm doing. He's watching me. He's excited. And uh, cause he knows that I'm about to feed him and, and I'm observing him as he's eating. And I'm thinking, well, he's a very intelligent creature. Like he knows me. He knew that I, there was that can represented dog food. Uh, and plus I knew like he was aware of many things that I wasn't aware of, like smells and sounds. And, but I thought here's something he doesn't know. He doesn't know how the food got into that can. Like he'll never, he'll never grasp that because dog brain, like it just doesn't work like that. Uh, he doesn't know what the stars are. If he looks up at them, he doesn't know what the moon is. He doesn't know that he's been taken out of his natural environment and all these other things. And I thought, well, gee, Richard, you're so damn smart. So your dog's at this level. You're at this level. What's here? What's there? What's there? What's there? And, and it suddenly occurred to me that my insistence on this complete, like no transcendental reality. I thought, how ridiculously uh, arrogant for me to say that. And then of course, as you go through life and you realize, you go back and you look at people in the past and everyone's always believed that they had it all figured out, like everyone. Go back to ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago, talk to an Egyptian peasant living on the Nile and he'd tell you, yeah, when that sun thing goes down, that's the god Ra and he goes below the disc of the earth that's shaped like a coin and he's going to be battling the demons of the underworld. You better hope he wins because if he doesn't, the world will end. Like, that's what they believed. We could look back and think, well, that's really quite wrong, but we now believe we've got it all figured out. Like, clearly we don't. And more fundamentally, our brains themselves are the limitation. Like our brains are amazing. They can allow us to um, 
engage in all kinds of incredible ideas and realities, but they have their limits. And in fact, we understand some. The, the limits are we organize reality spatially and temporally. Uh, do space and time actually exist the way that our minds tell us? Well, even guys like Immanuel Kant 200 plus years ago said, nope, not really. And Einstein and others kind of confirmed that. So we know that our brains organize reality. So with that said, I look at anomalies in our world today. As you, I think you know, I published a couple of books by Mike Cleland, The Owl Guy. And Mike, Mike's amazing. His work, uh, to me, Mike is the true heir to people like Jacques Vallée and John Keel in terms of looking at uh, this synchronistic world that we live in with this meta intelligence that really does seem at times to be guiding us like where each character is in a video game. It's like someone out there saying, yeah, I've got, I have Alex Cyprus for a couple of years. <clears throat> I'll have Dolan. Let's have them do an interview in early 2020. Okay, cool. Let's put that on the calendar. Like I, I whimsically wonder things like this because there are very bizarre, very bizarre uh, anomalies and synchronicities that happen in this world. And I don't pretend that I know what it is, but here's what I, why I'm getting into this. Because consciousness clearly is important in some fundamental way to the uh, nature of our reality. There is no question in my mind anymore. Uh, we've done enough genuine scientific experimentation that can support that. And, and secondly, we have in, an enormous hole in our general understanding of reality itself. Like there's things we don't get. And so in that hole are things like UFOs. In that hole are things like, um, you know, synchronicities and spirituality and uh, maybe even like, you know, definitely like psychic phenomena, psi phenomena um, absolutely fit in there. So we don't get it yet. And I'm, I'm hopeful that we might one day have a better understanding of it. Um, I don't consider it paranormal. I consider it, I consider those things normal, but we don't have a full understanding of it. So back to Grant and his whole focus on everything is consciousness. Well, you know what? Maybe even uh, well, before we I'll get let to you Grant, jump in. Yeah. I was going to say, why don't we throw, I was doing a little out of order, but let's throw Chris Bledsoe on the pile sure. here. Fantastic. Again, folks, you've got to listen to these series of interviews. But before we do, mm -hmm. do you want to just intro Chris a little sure. bit and tell people, you know, who he is, a little bit of the backstory, a little bit of the story of this four part interview series you did? And then yeah, I'm going to play the clip absolutely. that really gets to the point of Angel because I want to hone in on this good ET, bad ET, and get to the really big stuff. I mean, is this God? But first, who is Chris Bledsoe? And what did you do in this interview series? Chris, we may do a fifth uh, part, by the way. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll do that. But uh, Chris lives in North Carolina. He's a um, um, guy who built, built homes for a living, has a nice big family, uh, lots of kids, and had, he's, he, had a, he had a near-death experience as a child. Uh, which I think was significant. But essentially, as an adult, uh, starting in 2007, had a uh, a remarkable UFO encounter with his son and three other men uh, while they were fishing. And in the aftermath of that, had has had uh, a series of other very, very incredible encounters. I mean, the thing about his case that makes it so difficult is... Uh, the stories seem really fantastic to particularly a modern temperament, like encounters with what appears to be like an angelic being multiple times and uh, balls of light. And like, uh, and he is convinced by the way, that these are very benevolent uh, beings and he's had them repeatedly. But what, what makes his story hard to, to dismiss for me is a, the, the man himself, uh, which I, I realize is not a very good source of proof. Like, I really like him and I trust him. But on top of that, he's had a lot of corroboration from other individuals who have been around him when things have gotten crazy. That includes Grant Cameron. That includes Chase Kletsky. That includes John Alexander. And I'm sure there are other people as well. Diana so, Walsh-Pasolka. Oh, yes. Well, that's, they're very close. 
And, and he very also, as, as is revealed in your interview series, he is the real deal in terms of, yeah. you know, you were talking about uh, ATIP and being, being a case that the United States government was very, very interested in. They yes. were on it. Uh, MUFON was on it, did a real head trip and have to wonder about some kind of covert activity. All, again, all this is spelled out in the interview because I can even see your kind of trepidation and talking about the angel stuff, but that makes it even more significant that Dolan was able, was willing to go there. So without further ado, let me play the angel clip and then sure. let's talk about good ET, bad ET. And the church don't want to believe it. They think it's demonic. The MUFON and the UFO world rejected it because of uh, these individuals that were uh, controlling the thing. And here I'm stuck, and I've got these entities telling me, you got to tell your story. you got to tell your story. Right. Tell what you know. And I told MUFON I believe they were angels. I'll just put it right out there. And to do Day, I'm pretty sure that's what we're experiencing. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Okay. There it is. There it is indeed. And again, I just reemphasize this. I've done so to say the same thing over and over again. Listen to Richard's four parts. This is a UFO case of the of a first order, you know, has multiple eyewitnesses reported consistent with all the other, not all the other, but with many other UFO cases, this isn't a one-off kind of thing. And then he drops the angel bomb on us, which we've heard in various ways that, hey, we're really talking about God here in some way or something close to or associated with what we honor most as spirituality. What do you think, Richard? It's it's amazing having talked with him, and uh, I'll just point out those four interviews. I I felt that I really um, I told Chris I said I want to I want to get this story out logically and thoroughly, and you have to allow me to ask you uh, questions that are going to challenge you. But I I want to give you ultimately the opportunity to tell your story, and. We developed a very, I think, a very gentle rapport back and forth, and so I was very pleased about that. In terms of his um, his account of things, he challenges me to be perfectly honest. Like my instinct is to, I don't like these types of cases. My instinct is I want, I want a material, physical nuts and bolts case to deal with. I'm not going to lie. Like what I got into 25 years ago is this idea that. There's a physical phenomenon that's out there, that there are very likely beings of some sort that are running it. They don't seem to be us. They're probably physical. Maybe they've got magical type technology that makes them seem spiritual. Like this is how I would think it through. And as time has gone by, that has been challenged. And Chris, without a doubt, has challenged it very, very strongly for me. So, um, you know, I'm at the point now in my life, I'm almost 60, which just shocks me. I'm 57. And uh, boy, a lot of water's gone under the bridge in the years that I've done this. And I would say I'm at a point in my life where um, I actually do believe in uh, a dimension of reality beyond this physical realm that we live in. And um, I'll, I'll tell, I'll share a story that I have actually, I've told on my website, on the member's site, but I've not said this publicly and I'm, I'm happy to say it here. My father uh, died just over a year ago. He was uh, a month before he turned 80 in December of 2018, right? Uh, he and I were quite close. His name was also Richard. And I mean, I had a very kind of tight relationship with him his whole life. He was a retired New York City cop, um, worked at the World Trade Center, and had uh, September 11th off that day, among other things. The man he shared his job with was killed that day. But my dad and I were always close, and he died on December 2nd of 2018, um, living about 150 miles away from me. I had spoken with him on the phone earlier that day, and uh, I didn't expect, he was in the hospital, he, he was not feeling well, but no one thought he was gonna die. Um, and then, in that evening at around 8.20 in the evening, I was sitting on the couch next to Tracy. We were both working on our laptops. And I had just had two little ceiling lights installed like a few months earlier in my living room. 
and they were on a dimmer setting, a dim setting. And Tracy noticed at first, she looked up and she says, look at those lights, they're going crazy. They're going bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim, bright, dim. And me, I, you know, I got it all worked up. I'm like, God, stupid lights, what's going on with these? And I get up and I'm staring at the lights and I'm watching them freak, like these lights are freaking out. I'm thinking, I got, I got that wiring myself. Like I knew exactly what it was. I had a licensed contractor who installed them. I watched them go in. They were rock solid. And I turned the light on and off a few times and jammed the switch up and down the dimmer setting. And that stopped it. 15 minutes later, my sister called me to tell me that our dad had died 15 minutes earlier. And, and I think about that. I'm like, all right. So that's just a coincidence. So, so some of your really skeptical guests who've been on here in the past would say, ah, oh, just a coincidence. But how many times do you have to have a coincidence like that to think something happened here? Now, what really got me thinking was how the hell would my father have done that? Would he have flown instantly 150 miles over the New York State Thruway, gotten into the wiring of my home and shouted, hey, Richie, take a look at this. Like, is that what he was doing? Or how did he arrive and know like if you want to go down this road to go to those lights, which had just been installed and which were on a dim setting and to play with them. Like, how does that whole thing work? Like, I don't know how that works, but, but there's something in our physics. And yes, I'm going to just say, I choose to believe that somehow those, the, my father's death and that light phenomenon are related. I don't know how it's related. I don't know who did that or what that was, but that, tells me or it hints to me that's just one more example of our world giving us these hints that there's something much bigger going on here and and i'm with grant in the sense that and i'm with chris bledsoe in the sense that i don't think that it's all negative but i'm not with i don't know i don't know where grant stands on this actually but i wouldn't be with him if he were to say it's all positive I don't believe that. I mean, Stephen Greer would say it's all positive too. And I strongly disagree with that. I think um, that's just foolish. So I think that you know, that's almost to me, the third dimension of it, because I want to recap what you talked about, which I find yeah. so intriguing. The first uh, dimension isn't the proper word, forgive me. But the first question that pops to mind is what is the interface with our physical reality? You know, because we're interested in that. We, we have this kind of curious engineering mind. How did he make the lights shift like right, that? Right, exactly. <laughs> and the second, I think, right. question that pops up is, what is the technology of the consciousness interface? Correct. And I think that's particularly interesting because when we look at ET and we start looking at the cases, there's clearly, as Grant pointed out in that clip we played, from the 1950s, we understood there's mental telepathy as the means of communication. And we go, well, shit, we don't know how to do that. But apparently they do, and they have it like a, an app on their iPhone. So there's a technology component to consciousness that we just totally don't get. And it also relates to this time-space thing that we don't get. But then the third dimension of it, which you just, just touched on, and I think is so fascinating, and I really want to get to it because it gets to the heart of the video that you did with Tracy, hmm. and that's the good versus evil, the moral yeah. imperative. It's so challenging because we've all gone through, you know, you said you went through an atheistic phase. Any thinking person doesn't go through an atheistic phase because most of us are fed with this kind of narrow Christian uh, dogma, mm -hmm. you know, get on the ark kind of stuff. But when we blast past that, we're still faced with, is there good and bad? And how does that work? You talked right. about Grant. Let me play what Grant has to say about that. And then I want to get your take and then I'll offer my take on it. There's good and bad. There is a moral difference. You know, take the most extreme example, the guy who's uh, taking little kids and cutting them up and selling their body parts and sexually molesting them. That, in my mind, is is bad. It's evil. And then there, well, there's a bunch of shades in between. And then there are some really holy good people that I don't know how they do it, but they keep all their shit together and they really do it. That, no. How's your universe? Is, is there good and bad? Because some people in the consciousness camp say, well, there's really no good and bad. It all just kind of, you know, 
Well, if you go to the Newton stuff, no. If you get into reincarnation, it's all experience. If you, because the mistake you make is you, you, you did it in that sentence. You say, okay, there's these guys that cut up little people or whatever. Okay, and then there's these good people who basically have it all together. And I would go to, don't have to quote the Bible, but we, with the whole thing with the prostitute, Jesus said, Lead, he who is perfect cast the first stone. All you have, you do not have good people and bad people. You do not have good aliens and good bad deeds. aliens. You then have good souls. deeds. Are there good you have, deeds and there, bad there, deeds? There Are is, there... according to Ray Hernandez. Oh, shoot. I didn't mean to cut that off, but I did. Oh. So let's just... Let's just leave it right there. I do have to give a shout out to my friends at Gramerica who uh, hosted this conversation between Grant and I. But you, you get the gist of it. What do you think? Oh, man. You ever read uh, The Grand Inquisitor by Dostoevsky? I yes. Mean, I mean, so I, I'm aware of it. I can't say that. I've, all those it's, classics, it's a, I just have awareness. It's an amazing. So you two brothers are debating. One is a, a pious priest to be and one is an atheist intellectual and uh, the atheist wrote uh, this story the grand inquisitor and basically he was talking about his uh his his belief where he says look i don't believe in a god i don't believe that there's any any salvation enough that could justify um you know the kinds of crimes that of torturing children or killing children or d abusing people in such a horrible way. Like there's no, when you take someone who's innocent and you do such a horrible thing uh, and you're telling me God forgives all, uh, Ivan, the brother says, I don't want that God. I rebel against that God. Um, and, you know, Grant, Grant, I, I've never resolved this myself. I mean, honestly, I, I, I can tell you that I've struggled with it. Like I believe in my heart that there's good and evil. I do. And um, I know evil when I see it and I know good when I see it, but I, I get Grant's point here. Like, you know, our world is a little dot. It's a little dot. And when you step back, you can see there's this grand movement happening. And, and when we do terrible things, why do we do terrible things? Is it because we, because you could say maybe we lack, we lack the knowledge of the greater, the greater good. I don't know where I stand on that. Um, I may be struggling with that till the day I die. I mean, I can see both sides of it. I think in my daily life, I'm absolutely one of the people who sees good and evil. So on a practical level, there's good. And on a practical level, there's evil. And is I have no problem that, going after evil people. Is it possible that E.T. is representative of that dichotomy yeah. in yeah. individual cases? Because absolutely. I don't wanna, you know, are there bad ETs who are I, I think when, when people uh, when people deny this I think like what did you just like fall off the turnip truck like how how naive do you have to be so like imagine if we went back in history 2000 years to uh, or 3000 years to like ancient ancient Greece you know 2500 years ago and in our nice clothing with our little iPhones and our technology and our shiny teeth and our nice, you know, whatever we've got. And we talk to the, the Greek people there and they'd be like, wow, they've got their shit together. You must have figured all of your problems out. Like you probably don't even have any war. And we just look at each other and like, don't say a word. <laughs> um, the fact is advanced technology and capabilities, clearly we have learned does not mean that we are any better or different ethically than those people. We, we have changed in a lot of ways. It's true, like the overt kind of brutality that's gone away. We're, we're transforming ourselves uh, physiologically and evolutionarily because of civilization. That's something I'd love to talk about because I think it's affected our psychic abilities um, to the worst. But, but, but basically we're still human beings. We're still aggressive. We're supposed to be aggressive, by the way. That's a, that's a canard that like, oh, we're all supposed to be peace loving and all that nonsense. That's, that's stupid in my opinion. Like you have to have aggression if you want to survive in a world. Like you have to be able to fight. You have to be able to defend it. If nothing else against wild animals, you know, you've got, you have to be able to do that. That requires uh, certain qualities, particularly traditionally in men, that is testosterone, that is aggression. That's like, that's what you do to survive. And to uh, what we're seeing, this is, I'm getting off track here, but we're seeing our civilization really siphoning those qualities out of men.
and they're siphoning other qualities out of women as well. Um, but the fact is, back to good and bad, if we were to go back to that ancient period, those people might be fooled into thinking that we've got it all figured out and we don't have it all figured out. And so if we move ahead and we look at these other species that are out there that have abilities that we lack, the real danger, the foolish danger is that people will think, oh, well, yeah, they would have, they have to be good because otherwise they would have destroyed us by now, which is what you hear Stephen Greer saying and he's been saying forever. You know, we would know if they were aggressive. They would have shown that, to which I would certainly beg to differ. I don't think that's a logical point whatsoever. There's lots of ways, uh, there's lots of reasons that any life form should at least, if not be mistrustful, then at least be cautious when dealing with a new life form. Because the fact is, uh, I'm not a utopian, I'm a realist. And what a realist says is that, all life forms and all species have their own goals. And it's not always win-win, by the way. That's, that's another bullshit ideology that we've taken on in the last couple of hundred years in our society that, oh, it's everyone can win all the time. I would say win-win happens sometimes it can happen, and sometimes it doesn't happen. It all depends on the circumstances. So I don't know if these ETs are evil or... Uh, some of them, or if they're just following their own imperative for their own species and doing what they do, which might might damage our interests. Like, that's totally possible. Well, let me jump over and play devil's or, advocate. Or it might help us. You know, and, and I guess I'll add, and play the clip, but I would just say I'm not confident that we have a whole lot of information on the motivations of these beings. I've talked in depth to David Jacobs. I've talked in depth to the love and light crowd as well. And like everyone's got their own take on this. And I'm not convinced that anyone really has nailed it fully so that I, so that I sit back and think, oh yes, this is the person who's got it correct. Like I just, I haven't gotten to that point yet. I think David, David Jacobs is really interesting. Had him on the show a couple of times, had a kind of threaded debate with him and Mary Rodwell, who you would kind of call more of the love and light. Oh, Mary. Crowd. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I, I love respect Mary Rodwell because I respect her methodology. Her protocol seems solid. She seems very aware of that, you know, of, of how to do oh. good clinical practice in terms of, um, hypnosis, but Lee she was fooled by the firefighter who turned himself blue on Skype. Just got to say that was a whole uh, ridiculous, right. but you just run, you just kind of run the numbers. It, what I was going to really yeah. say for me at the end of that is, you know, I, I thought Mary was making a really good case and David is making a really good case too. And then I asked Mary yeah. at the end, I said, David is insisting on one thing, that it is a program. And she paused and goes, well, yeah, it is a program. I was like, well, what, what do you mean? It's a program. There's an agenda. There's an initiative. They are trying to accomplish something. I don't see how that fits with your overall narrative, but let me digress further because yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. a friend with, uh, with Ray Hernandez, the Beyond UFO uh, people. They wrote that book and right. the Edgar Mitchell yeah, yeah. Foundation guy, uh, super nice guy. And the one thing that, that uh, Ray has at this point is he has data and you can not like his data, or you can argue with the methods of his, that, of, that he used for collecting that data. Yes and yes. So I, I would just say yes and yes for me. But anyway, I'm not on. sure. I'm not sure. You'd, I think you'd have to really drill into that. You know, he has now partnered with Dr. Jeffrey Long, who is a radiation oncologist from mm -hmm. Louisiana, who has compiled the largest database of near-death experience. And having spoken with... Uh, Jeff, who's New York Times bestselling author and very accomplished scientific researcher. A lot of people uh, uh, kind of have negative things, disparaging things to say about those surveys, but they don't do it in a very scientific way. It, their criticism is not scientific because I always remind people that, you know, if you want to talk about pain research, it's experiential. If you want to talk about depression research, grief research. So we have a pretty understood methodology for collecting, organizing experience. So you look at the way that Ray did it. I don't find a lot of holes in his methodology. Is his data set as complete as it needs to be? Are people being left out of the conversation that would add a different flavor to it? I, I think that is possibly true, and I've been very direct in telling 
ray that and say, don't wind up on the wrong side of this by pushing your agenda too far. But And there is a definite has- agenda that's being pushed on that by that book, which I, I'm uncomfortable with. I don't, I don't think, I it think you'd have strident. to back that up. I think you'd have to back that up sure. and support that, uh, sure. the idea that there's an agenda, because what they would say is that mm-hmm. the agenda, and, and Grant Cameron's right there with him, right? I mean, he is part oh, of yeah, that yeah. project. Right. He mm-hmm. would say that the agenda, if you will, fell out of the data. Now, I know that to be true of the near-death experience research. And geez, like I say, please, I have too many interviews with trusted academic peer-reviewed scholars has been over 200 peer-reviewed papers on near-death experience and i get the same bullshit from skeptics all the time they just don't know the data they don't know the methodology they don't know the researchers and then they say oh that's agenda agenda driven and i'm like who has the agenda none of these guys you know well i i want to jump in so i i actually agree with that last statement you make and i think skeptics are way way uh they, they they're funny because they don't realize how ignorant they are um my my only critique i i think beyond ufos has a lot of does have merit to it. So I don't want to just dismiss the whole thing. But what I don't like about it is this is my understanding. Maybe you can correct me. And I've not spoken with Ray. So I'll just say that. But uh, that it was it's all self reported experiences. And without without any real investigation. So you and I both I have spoken with countless people who've uh, volunteered their experiences to me and they've told me their story. And I'll just tell you, like on a personal level, a lot of those people seem very credible to me. And a lot of them do not seem credible to me. A lot of them do not seem credible to me. And a lot of them, frankly, seem mentally unstable and mentally ill. And this is something no one ever talks about, but it's definitely a reality. And the other thing is a lot of it is very ideologically driven. And I I guess I'll just say like new age ideology. So um, a huge, from what I could gather, a significant portion of the respondents to that survey, and I don't know this for a fact, but they seem to be from basically Southern California, maybe Sedona, uh, very like new age cultural centers. Now, I know that's not entirely true, and, and I don't know what the numbers are, but it strikes me as a very high percentage. So you've got a very strong ideological component already going into that, where all of those people, probably almost every last one of them will say, yeah, our Space Brothers, our Galactic Federation are here to help us. Um, I have a nice the, collection. The, the little bit that I've, that I've looked into his research and spoken with Ray a couple times. And again, right. I'm pretty, pretty well versed in how this research works. And one thing I have to do is kind of dispel the notion that if you do the survey right, that mm. shouldn't come into play. So we can then look at the methodology that they used and say, hey, their methodology failed in this respect. Like you're saying, the okay. sample size was not big enough. The sample size was skewed or biased in this way or that way. But there's ways to get around that. There's ways to control that because they do it all the time. Like I'm saying, if you're yeah, yeah. doing a research on pain, you're asking people the same questions. We rely on that. We have a method of doing it. See, now, And the people he's had on board who helped him, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, Dr. Rudy Shields, Harvard, uh, physicist. Yep. I mean, he has a panel of very smart people that. Yeah, they're good that, people. And, and again, like I've gone over this a million times, like in parapsychology mm-hmm. research. And I remember Rupert Sheldrick, a biologist from Cambridge, and, you know, he, he's done all this research and then the skeptics. And, and then you talk to Rupert and he's a pretty calm guy. But then when you really get him wound up, he says, You don't think I thought about that the first five minutes after I thought of this thing? I thought, How am I going to control for sample size? How am I going to control for, you know, being skewed this way or that way? So people who know how to do this do it correctly. So the question would be, someone needs to dig into that and say, here are the faults I see in the methodology. And I just throw one other thing. It's like people say, you can't do online surveys. Well, there's been all sorts of published work that suggests that online surveys are no less reliable than in-person surveys. I mean, you you can, depending in. on the subject. And, and by the way, I guess we should just tell people, I'm sure many listeners are aware, but this study essentially concludes that the vast majority of, of uh, what we might call alien or ET encounters are very positive, very benign. I think it's like 80% or more are very positive, uh, right? Something like that by the, by the respondents and something like 5,000 individuals, I think, uh, gave their uh, data on this. So it's a, it's a fairly large survey. And, and I, I don't think that you can't do online surveys. I don't think that that's necessarily the case, but for something like ET experiences, 
I would be a little careful. You know, when I talk with David Jacobs, for example, about this. So as you might imagine, David just would roll his eyes at that and think, oh my God, they've got it all wrong. But his reasoning is as such. He would say, because when you're dealing with these beings, they deal in deception. And he said, when I, when I put someone through hypnotic regression, I've got to go several times with them. I've got to go deep until I can expect to actually reach something past all the mental shielding that's there. Now, you can take what he says and say, well, you're just, that's just your way of, of uh, peeling away whatever resistance to get to your preconceived notion of what, what that is. Um, who knows what is true here? I don't, I don't really know, but I have, I don't know how much stock I put in that, that, that free study beyond UFOs. I'm just not sure. And it does strike me as a bit strident. I have to, I have to say like the way Ray that they can come across, Ray can come across as strident. And I, I think, and I've, I've said that in person, yeah. I'll say it on the air. I don't think that helps him or helps what he's trying to do. He no, should it's a bit be like evangelistic for his point. He should of be view. about the, he like should that. be about the data. And, and that's how near death experience science right. has advanced because it's always about the data and you take criticisms of the data to heart and you make the data stronger and stronger. And I think you'll see that in the future. It is a first step. And I do have right. to say, you know, the other thing, if you drill into the data, which is always what I do with, with Ray, when I talk to him, I say, Ray, yeah, but you got my, you got 15 or uh, I forget what it is. I think by my count, it was above 20%. You got my lab. What the F is a, my, is my lab doing in there? <laughs> if this is, if this is God, if you're going to be in, in your near death, uh, in your near death experience, life review, when ET has to go through their life review, what are they going to say about that my lab experience? What do they say about the reptilians raping, you know, some, uh, some woman? What are they going to say about that? What does the ET look like in their life review? I, I, I think that, that that data is out there, and I agree with you to the respect that I, that data doesn't come through enough in Ray's work. It is worrisome to me. That data has to be in there because we, we do understand that to be part of this experience. Uh, I was even going to... I think, yes, I agree. I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that um, the whole good versus bad ET thing, uh, a lot of it is guided by our, you could almost say our, our political orientation, liberal or conservative. I mean, it's almost that simple. I think people who are by their natural personality would consider themselves very liberal are much more likely, in my experience in looking at this for 20 years, uh, to look at these beings as part of, you know, the galactic community and, and as good. And these are the people who are, I find more likely um, to interpret their telepathic downloads as a positive experience and, and so on. Um, and I think those who are more inclined to interpret this phenomenon in a, as an adversarial or negative way tend to be a little bit more conservative in their overall orientation. That's my own observation. I know there's exceptions. And the other, the other thing that, to distinguish is physical versus non-physical contact. So when people tell me that they get a download or they have a non-physical encounter, I don't, I don't always dismiss it, but you've got to really bring me some reason to believe. Uh, whereas opposed to people who talk about physical encounters, I'm much more interested in those. And when you look at the physical encounters, uh, that, you know... See, I'm not, sure about your bias. Got... I'm not sure about your bias there, Richard. I mean, you're, to go back to right. your flickering lights, I mean, I've heard this thing over and over again. That is a non-physical you know, interface. I know you got me. You got me there. I'm, I'm going to admit that. Um, but it, and it is a bias. My bias is toward physical material encounters. I'm, I'm not going to deny that. So maybe that's something I'll have to keep working on. Um, I'm admitting that here. But, um, but I'm, I'll also say that a lot of people who have come to me with encounter stories, I guess all I would say is they're not, they're not always credible people. And it's not something that people ever like. We don't like to discuss this in this field. We don't like to talk about the fact that there's a lot of seriously damaged individuals. I hate to say this, but there are a lot of damaged people who are drawn to this field, sometimes because they've had experiences, but right. sometimes, sometimes <laughs> right. though, because they're damaged. And like, it's hard to distinguish like what, right. um, what is what. And, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to figure that out, but so 
I have, I have uh, sympathy and I have, I have compassion for all of those people because you can tell they're in pain. But beyond that, I have to try to get to like what is true. And I don't, I don't know how to get to the truth of some of those stories. You know, when, back in the days when I knew Bud Hopkins, I was at his place once and he showed me all of his collection of photographs of scoop marks and mark, body marks and all of that. He had a huge collection of that. Um, Bud was all about getting physical evidence and um, to whatever extent possible, even, even though he did hypnotic regression. Uh, that was his, his predilection. And, and that's, that remains mine because it, it's, it's something that I, I guess I can say I know how to do. Like I know how to, to deal with the physical world. Having said all of that, I've been struggling for the last decade or more in trying to incorporate a true understanding of consciousness into my understanding of ufology and of the, of the world itself. So I'm open to it. I don't throw it out, but I, I, try to, I try to treat it carefully. I don't, I'm not someone who's ever just going to embrace it because it seems like a good idea. We've, we have to find out, out a way to be, I don't know how to be evidence-based with some of this consciousness type of evidence. Um, maybe what Ray's on onto is a good idea. Like you get, you do a survey and you get as many people as you can get, but are, are all you doing is just getting social, you know, social prejudices and, and social ideologies instead? Like, is that all you're getting? And I, I, I suspect that a lot of it is what, what he's getting is that he's getting just people offering an ideological take on maybe an interesting dream experience they had, like something that might not con be considered very strong evidence is being considered evidence in some of these accounts. Do, do you think that's, that's an unreasonable objection or well, is there something to that? You know, I, I, I guess I, I go back, rewind it a little bit back to what you said is we need somebody, we need both sides. We need yeah, somebody yeah. who's out there willing to collect the evidence the best we can because you know, the thing about the God thing, the angel thing with Chris Bledsoe, or the God thing that, that Grant Cameron mentions, which is really, I think, a punt when I say, and I agree with you, you know, to say, well, there's no good or evil. And, you know, uh, look at Michael Newton in between lives and it all works out and we're here for a purpose. It's like, I need something more than that, buddy. You're, you're going to have to explain the rape and torture of little That's kids right. system. You're going to have to explain it to me tell, better tell than that. Tell it to their parent. Tell that to their kid's parent. Yeah, tell that, that to tell important. that to yourself if you are a parent. Tell that exactly. to yourself if you're a victim. If you have been perp this has been perpetrated on you. Don't we need to hear and respect your story? We don't need to take it and then you know turn it into something that we imagine it to be inside of our thing. But and I just I, I gotta say like I think a lot of those people and I don't I don't know about Grant in particular um, and he is my friend but I think a a large number of those people who have that opinion, I really wonder how, how much of the world they've ex experienced. I truly wonder. Like, have they really experienced truly evil people? There's a lot of folks in this world who've lived very insulated lives and they, they live in their own kind of bubble. So um, I'm not inclined, you know, Yes, I understand in the greater philosophical, you step, take 10 steps back, you can see the big picture. There's no good, there's no evil. Okay, you can make that argument. But in our world, I think there's definitely good and there is definitely evil. But it does get complicated. I mean, right. you know, that's why it's so interesting. And I think it's more than just fun. It's, it's important to kind of switch back to the Chris Bledsoe yeah. story, right? and say, here's someone who's run the gauntlet, done all the right stuff in terms of trying to understand his experience, and seems to genuinely have come to the conclusion that is, unfortunately for you, very much in line with what Ray is saying. Because that is kind of, that's, that's true, Chris yeah. Bledsoe's story. It, it, Chris Bledsoe's story is repeated over and over again in Ray's research, which is, I was traumatized by this. I thought it was the worst thing in the world. And over time, I came, I came to understand it as part of my path, part of my spiritual awakening, and part of my spiritual journey. And that opens us up, like to, to you and to me, it opens us up to all sorts of abuse. 
We've heard that over and over again from every guy who's spinning some cult or new age religion or even old world religion as a means to get us and manipulate us and control us. But at the same time, I think we have to remain open to the possibility that there may be some fundamental truth to that. And that's why I've been so interested in the near-death experience, because it does, you know, just to recap, people listen to the show, I've heard this like a thousand times, but the brain is out of the equation in the near-death experience experience. Science has brought us to the point where we can say that. We have resuscitation studies. We have studies of people who are under extreme anesthesia and cardiac arrest. We know that the brain is out of the equation there. And now these people are having these kind of encounters and experiences that have this overlap with the ET experience, but also have this transcendent Chris Bledsoe, angel, God kind of thing going on too. So we're kind of stuck with having to deal with both. And I love right. that you're driving a stake in the ground on one hand and saying, I, I do have to hold the Dolan line of evidence. And at the other hand, you're still doing these freaking interviews and you're going to do it's, part it's five true. with Chris it's, Bledsoe. That's awesome. It's, it's totally true. And you know, what's funny um, is when I said a little while ago, like there's good and there's evil. I, 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 I realized like I better be careful with that because like that's, that can be a very, I mean, I'm realizing I've, I've contradicted myself probably about countless times in this interview already. And, and by stating that there's absolute good and, and evil, well, actually, I didn't say that. I said there's relative good and evil. But I still have to be very careful about that because when you think about international relations, for example, which is a very big interest of mine, um, you want to be really careful when you start equating the interests of one nation with good and another nation with evil. Like that's a really bad, bad mistake to make. Um, so I don't like to make that mistake. So I just, I think on a personal level, there are evil things that are done and on a, there are good things that are done. And I, I would maintain that, but um, we do have to be careful. Like I don't like this is why I don't like zealots and I don't, I don't like fanatics of almost any sort. They scare me. And by the way, I think we're living in an era where people are really becoming zealots in all different ways. And I think it's by design. I think they're, I, th that's, you know, not to get political cause I don't play that, but I think yeah. that's the role of uh, Donald Trump. That's why I think Donald Trump, you know, and, uh, and several people have come out and said this, this isn't original, but I think both those candidates were suitable to a certain group that, cares about that stuff at you a higher Trump level. And Trump and Hillary? Um, I think both. both Trump and Hillary were acceptable to a certain ruling class that is the techno, uh, new world order, banking, finance, intelligence stuff that I don't fully understand, but seems to always be in play, whether it's 9-11 or whatever it is. But I think that one advantage of Trump for that certain uh, the class above the classes is that it created inc incredible divisiveness so that people don't think about the fact that the Patriot Act was rubber stamped at the same time they were doing the charade about impeachment or the rest of this. Divisiveness is a good tool if you were playing the game, if you're trying to, and I'm getting into this political rant, which I just never do. But No, I, I think uh, you have some good points. I, I have a different take on Trump than you do. But I do believe absolutely um, that the divisiveness is something that's, that's definitely played up. And this is something, by the way, that the United States intelligence community is the master of doing around the world with through what we call color revolutions. And what we're now seeing is that that model is almost being, is being brought back here to the United States, um, a way of emphasizing cultural or linguistic um, or ideological differences to divide people. So that's definitely happening. Um, yeah, I look at Trump a little differently than um, some of my very like left leaning friends look at him. Um, but I, I, I mean, he's not Jesus and he's not Hitler 2.0. Like I oh, don't, right. I don't oh. either of those extremes. He's, um, he's a self-serving politician who probably, didn't even expect to run for president. Like, I think, I think he did it from, from, I've heard this from two sources. Uh, he did it basically to increase his brand, his personal brand. 
Uh, but I actually don't believe that he was the t uh, tool of um, of the elites. I think that would have, for the Republican Party, I, I would have thought Jeb Bush would have been much more amenable. I mean, the, the kind of uh, the straight up neocon globalist type of model, which uh, America's had for uh, for many, many generations, Democrat and Republican, both fulfilled that. And, and Trump kind of didn't as a candidate. He was actually... Um, you know, he, he was as a candidate. He was truly outsider. Well, I'm going to push this just a tiny bit further, yeah. and then we're going to wrap it up because you've been super generous with your time. But from a political, <laughs> the political analyst in you, one thing I've always kind of thrown out there is that I think we we can go down the wrong path if we understand these maneuvers as being proactive versus reactive in a lot of cases. So it's not like somebody is working. This is my take. And I want to get your opinion of it. It's not like someone is running a grand chessboard. It's more like they're letting the game kind of play out a little bit and they're going, Oh, what's our next move from here? They're like jumping into somebody else's game that plays out. And the same thing, like you mentioned at the very beginning of the show yeah, about yeah. disclosure, they don't know which way disclosure is. They don't know if right. Tom DeLong, if it's going to hit, but once it does, Oh, what do we do with this? Oh, you know what? We can do this with it. We can do that with, it. I don't know. No, I, I agree with you. I think that's right. I think it's, there's a lot of reactivity. I'm glad you brought, brought this up. Uh, I don't, I don't believe that. Um, I don't think there's like a 50 year plan on this. I don't think there's even a 10 year plan on this, but I do think that there are contingencies that are in place. Um, and for example, in terms of disclosure, what I would, what I would argue, I've been saying this for a while now, especially like the last six months where my take on this has really crystallized a little bit more. I think what we're seeing are factions within the elite groups. So there is probably a disclosure friendly faction and there's definitely a disclosure unfriendly faction. And I think that TTSA is caught, like they're right in the, they're in the midst of that. They've got a couple of people on their side within, you could say the deep state that are helping them. And they have enemies. They've got lots of enemies in there as well. Uh, think of it this way. Like they, we know that there's at least six, not just three videos, but at least six videos and probably more that they know about that they have not been able to get all of those other ones declassified. They got three declassified a couple of years ago, and that's it. They've gotten nothing ever since. And um, it, it seems that Elizondo got a lot of that stuff released through um, somewhat deceptive means. John Greenwald's um, done some research on this and uses that to criticize Elizondo from some of these emails in 2017. What I would say is Elizondo was just being a little weasel wording with uh, what these videos were, not describing them as UFOs or UAP in order to get them cleared. Uh, I think the people in the Pentagon who cleared them probably didn't fully realize what they were clearing. And so then they were cleared and the damage was done. They weren't supposed to be cleared. Um, that I, I give them credit for, frankly. I think that's a kind of a smooth move, but I don't think that's gonna happen anymore. So I think the gig is up for them and I don't think they're gonna get anything else cleared. But, um, but so I think they're fighting their own little game here. And I don't, it's not a CIA op. I, I don't care how many times some random. Well, well, hold, hold on, because you, you, you just laid an awesome, classic little Dolan factoid there that fits into the puzzle and, and, and kind of turns it yeah. in, in a way. And I commend you for that. But, you know, come on, Richard. It is all a psyop. It's just all. What, because, How and why? Explain, well, please. Because you what is gave, the goal a, you gave a presentation. It, it all depends on what you define as psyop. Because right. we had this like pre-interview. This is a good roundup. We'll come full circle. Right. We had this, this pre-interview thing and you were like, hey, man, Alex, don't push that uh, psyop narrative on me. It just doesn't fit in this case, <laughs> which I love. I love the pushback. I really do. Especially That's from fine. Someone, do it. Well, especially from somebody else. But, but if you're going to push the psyop, then, then you've got to at Here's least my point. provide a Here's thesis. my point. Here's my point. Right. Then I listened to your disclosure presentation in Copenhagen, and I'm yeah. like, "Oh no, we uh, Dolan and I are in the total on the same page in this. You know, this is manipulated. This is done for a purpose. This is per purposely yes. done to you know get this reaction." Now, so it all comes down to what you define as a psyop, and I think you put it in in, in very stark terms at the beginning, where you said we're a post democracy, post constitution. Well, shit in that. And now, then everything is a psyop, is a means to control and manipulate something. So it really... Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess, yes, to that. Um, 
but who's PSYOP? So is, is TTSA doing a PSYOP? Do we, we just want to call that a PSYOP? If we do, then we're kind of losing the meaning of the, of the word. They've got their own spin. Yes. Peter they, Lavenda? Peter what, Lavenda? PSYOP, PSYOP, PSYOP. Why? Like, why? Because I, I know Peter. I, I've spoken I, with him for years. I don't know Peter uh, uh, directly, but mm-hmm. to me, he's kind of come out as saying lifelong player, lifelong uh, spook ex- associated with that. And his story just doesn't wash. His idea of, you know, the, the whole thing of, I, I met Tom DeLong. I didn't know it was him. And we got together and said, we have to blow the lid off this. We, yeah. The only place we can go is the CIA. It just, it just doesn't ring true. But I've digressed there because you, you don't have to agree with that. No one has to agree with that. It just sounds very, very suspicious. Well, okay. But um, what no one has ever done, the only thesis I've ever heard from anyone who says that this is a PSYOP, particularly an intelligence community PSYOP, is uh, for the reason of amplifying fear by talking about a threat, a threat from these UAP. Elizondo does say that quite a lot. He loves that word, threat on the TV show Unidentified. He loves the word threat or, or potential threat. He does it all the time. Pentagon. Uh, and so that the idea is then that they're using this threat narrative to uh, frighten the public and you know, t- then take your pick. Increase defense spending for what? To protect against aliens or to uh, do the UFO alien reveal and scare the shit out of people so that they come running to the safer government. Like, that's basically the thesis. And I just... Uh, I'm not persuaded by that at all, not even remotely. Um, when Elizondo is talking about a threat, I feel like I'm reading my first two volumes of UFOs in a national security state. It's got the exact same. What did I do in those books? I focused on military encounters with unknown objects that were indeed seen as a potential threat. When you have unknown objects hanging out over sensitive nuclear installations that are not supposed to be there, where aircraft go to intercept and they zip off and do their thing. Well, hell, what is that supposed to be? Like any reasonable person responsible for air defense would have to consider that at least a potential threat. The reason I focused on those in my books is for several reasons. One, because they have a paper trail, which is important. Two, they prove the U.S. government's lying about its lack of interest in UFOs. But three, the fact that you've got these military encounters, it's like almost a way of shaking the public and getting their attention. It's like, you're not even looking at UFOs. You don't give a shit about UFOs. You're not talking about it, but take a look. Your military is being baffled by these again and again. So I don't think it's an illegitimate approach. Um, I, th- I do think you can overplay it, absolutely. But, but my take on why they bring up the threat they're, they are desperate. TDSA is at a point of desperation right now. Like people don't even see this, all right? Um, they can't get Congress to do inquiries. They had, they had a congressional briefing. Well, that's good, but they haven't gone any further as far as anyone can tell. They're not getting, they get a little bit of press follow-up. Some Trump White House isn't doing squat as far as we know. You can see like these guys are doing everything they can do to say, hey, pay attention. we got a threat here, which, okay, maybe. It's a tactic. It's not an, it's, that's a it's spin. It's a political battle. It's absolutely. Is it a PSYOP? I don't, I think if someone's going to argue that what TTSA is doing is a PSYOP, they have got to come up with a better argument than what I've heard so far. Like a CIA, like, um, one, one but individual when you're talked turning about up their- the volume, but when you're turning up the volume on the threat, right. when you're turning up the volume on the global issue, which is right. the other card they're playing, you know, we can call it different terms, but number one, it's political. Like you just said, yes, anyone exactly. who doesn't see it as a political thing, it, it is political. And there's this guy who sits in the White House right now. And I, I can't get over when I hear these conversations and no one ever, you're, you're talking about Trump. You know, and I'm not saying I'm pro-Trump or against Trump, but you can't have this conversation and not talk like there isn't another side to this. There isn't another group, you know, and often that's kind of the conversation. Like we're just going to kind of carry on like just one side. So number one, that's it. So the mm-hmm. globalization thing and the threat thing, to me, you're, you're, when you're turning up the volume on those, you're playing PSYOP. Well, I, I, I mean, it depends on how you want to define what a PSYOP is. To me, a PSYOP is 
explicitly something that I would associate with the intelligence community, manipulating public opinion through the media for a particular end or goal. Like that's classically, you know, Operation Mockingbird throughout all of its decades of operation and uh, media control, which we all know is, is reality. Uh, those are psyops. Psyops can be done against domestic populations. They can be done against foreign populations. Um, it's a form of uh, hybrid warfare, which the U.S. loves to say that the Russians are masters at, but the U.S. itself is the master of hybrid warfare. So if I look at TTSA's operation as a psyop, someone's going to have to provide some reasonable evidence more than the fact of saying, well, some of these people are ex-CIA. Like, that's, sorry, like, that's a weak argument. That's a, a weak argument. Um, we're at a point in, in our world uh, that I, it's disturbing to me that it's, it's almost like postmodernism has invaded ufology to this extent where we are now arguing over someone's bona fides and what we think they mean rather than listening to the damn words that are coming out of their mouth. Like where I don't find a lot of people listening to very smart articles by Chris Mellon, for example, that he's had on the Hill and he's had in other places on their website. In fact, the TDSA site, he's put some very interesting information on there. Uh, instead, what people are doing is they think they're smart enough to analyze behind his words into his true motivations, whatever they think those are. That's postmodern in my view. That's like taking critical analysis to such an extreme that you're actually not listening to the other person and what they're actually saying. To me, the most important thing is actually listening to what is being said and to listening to what the information that is being provided. That's vastly more important than all these people who think, oh yeah, I, I know what they're trying to do. It's like, stop that. Stop embarrassing yourself and stop embarrassing the rest of us by thinking you know what everyone's motivation is and just listen. Like what they have provided for the past two whatever years is a shitload of information that no one else has put out there yet. Like that's the fact. They, they and they alone are responsible for nearly all of the US Navy's admissions. They've been pushing that. Uh, they are responsible for like all those New York Times pieces that, yes, the New York Times is the mouthpiece of the establishment. But the fact is when the New York Times publishes halfway decent articles on UFOs, which they did last May in 2019 on the USS Roosevelt, like that was actually, that was a decent piece of journalism that Leslie and Helene Cooper and Ralph Blumenthal did. That's TTSA getting that information out there. Like they are intimately involved in that. So those are significant things that they have done. And it, I find it disheartening. Like the day is going to come when they're gone. They don't exist and they've broken up and, and we're going to look back and think, wow, we treated them really shitty. <laughs> well, they were out there working and trying to move the ball a little bit down the field. That's what I think is going to happen. You know, that's an awesome take, and I'm going to wrap things up here, but I want to draw people's attention to, again, the, the if you're interested in that last part of this discussion, the presentation you did on Copen in Copenhagen, because you lay out in a very Richard Dolan systematic way, one after another, and one little thing I was going to pick up on is you trace, document, and support the idea that that was the beginning of the disclosure movement. And that, I think you, you right. call me on okay. in a very, you know, everyone stops at the New York Times, like I do. I stop at the New York Times and go, ah, yeah, nah, nah, nah. and you go, no, wait, that's the beginning. Then look at True. Look at WAPO. Look at the next article that Leslie, Leslie Kane publishes. Look at this one. Look at this one. Very, you, you can't argue with that because you do a great well, job of laying it out. Let me say this. This is me contradicting myself again. I, I mean, I said we're not in a disclosure era because it's not a government promoted thing. But uh, I'll share with you something that Putoff said to me in an email uh, earlier this year. And, you know, he, um, talk, I'm talking about, I'm trying to remember exactly what I asked him. Oh, this is in connection to the Wilson League. Um, but he used a phrase with me. He said, yep, it's just more toothpaste out of the tube. And I've been using that phrase for this year. Uh, 
it's a really apropos statement. It, what's happening is with disclosure, uh, with, with the disclosures of these various things that have been happening, it's more toothpaste out of the tube. It's not going back in. Um, and so now we're at a point where there's a bit of momentum for the first time in our lifetimes for the UFO subject actually to get a little bit more and better coverage in our official mainstream, yes, totally corrupt, corporate dominated media, but nonetheless, it's getting more coverage. That's very significant. So um, the question, and now you're seeing like there's media people. I mean, some people have very strong opinions about Fox, but there's Tucker Carlson, who's actually doing superb journalism on UFO compared with any other person out in the mainstream. Like this guy seriously has said some courageous things about this and he's done some good work on this. So there is definitely momentum happening. The, the only question is how far will it go? But the problem that I just see here is I, I like the, the uh, analogy of the irresistible force versus the ir immovable object. So the disclosure movement is, is in, possibly becoming an irresistible force. But secrecy is that immovable object. And, and one, one thing you learn when you study the, the Eric Davis notes on Admiral, the Admiral Wilson interview is just how deep, how privatized and how deep and how secret a lot of this UFO secret is and how difficult it will be to get this pulled out into the light of day. I don't know how that's going to work out. You know, DeLong last summer dropped a couple of very interesting tweets about this. And people love to laugh and dismiss this guy, but he said a couple of smart things. And one of the things had to do with, uh, he said, you think ATIP was the whole, the whole program? He said, think again. We're not talking tens of millions. He says, try hundreds of millions of dollars. And I'm, I'm guessing it's more than that. But the other thing he said is, if you really want to end this secrecy, you need a fundamental legal revolution. And I think that's right. Like the legality of this illegal business has got to change somehow and how to change it. Like, this is a serious issue. Like the only thing that I can see is when enough people, when the culture changes, like the only way it's gonna happen is if the culture changes sufficiently so that enough people realize like, this is really important, we've gotta do something. And, and then when a lot more brains than ours are looking at this, talking about this, and there's actual pressure to open this up. And then, and only then, and maybe only then will we have a chance. That my big hope when, when with Bryce I wrote after disclosure a decade ago was I thought something big could happen. We're in an unstable civilization where there's WikiLeaks and there's all these other leaks and there's all these, everyone's got a camcorder or their phone's got video. And like I envisioned like there could be a big event that would happen that would cause like an avalanche. And that avalanche hasn't happened. What we are seeing though is drip, 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 drip. And it's becoming significant. And I'm waiting for that avalanche. Like I think that's still likely when we get to a certain critical mass. And I don't know what that critical mass is. I don't know what that will be. That is such an awesomely nuanced response. It is, like I've said throughout this interview, that is, that is classic Richard Dolan. I don't know if you've totally picked me up and turned me around, but you yeah, kind of maybe turned me around a little bit. Well, you Richard turned me around on a few things as well on consciousness. So. <laughs> It's like a really fun little intellectual wrestling match that we just had here. And um, no, there's doing... no wrestling with you, man. You're the, you're the, you're the boss. You're the no. boss jujitsu dojo master. You, it, and, and you're doing, you know, I mentioned this maybe in the pre-interview role. I'm a Richard Dolan member. It's like one of the best values out there for anyone who's interested in this stuff because you produce so much great content and so much which you give away for free but there's also stuff that's behind the wall as it should be can you tell people a little bit about what you do yep. in that respect and stuff that's coming up for for you that that maybe people should have a look out for you bet absolutely thank you alex and thank you for saying what you did about my site that tracy and i run that and it's a lot of work but uh 
I've decided, look, if I want to devote my life to this type of thing that I do, like I have to figure out a way to make it work. So uh, I can't trust YouTube because that's the hammer is definitely coming down on YouTube in every way. Um, so what I've decided is, I mean, I sell some books, I write books and sell those, but I've created this website, Richard Olin members, where it's true. I put a, I put a tremendous amount of content out there for people who want to go to the site and people can complain. They're like, well, you know, you're trying to make money. And I'm like, yes, I am trying to make money. Like we're not 12 years old. Like the people who say, Oh my God, so-and-so is trying to make money out of a, out of this field. Like, are you a child? <laughs> like, what do you think people do uh, to live? Like, it, it just never ceases to amaze me. Um, so and, I got. And it's also, I you know, I like the way people put it, and it's really true. It's the value for value exchange. Yeah, exactly. This, people are free to valuable. And what else are you spending your money on? And you know, in right. a lot of ways, we're all becoming used to it more, right? So we pay for Netflix, and then we're like, I already paid for Netflix. Do I really have to pay for ESPN Plus? Well, yes, you have to pay for ESPN Plus, and that's, that's right. just the way it is. So right. I don't have. I, I agree. I think it, it's it's a childish complaint. And when you look at the numbers, I mean. Uh, getting getting rich i mean you know no no i'm trying to live pewdiepie's getting rich but richard <laughs> dolan's not making millions of dollars no. off of this he's just hopefully we're we're supporting him to continue to do that who else is going to do this research no no thank you um yeah um, it allows me to live and, and i'm happy and it works so uh this is a, a, a model and a system that is working for me for now but in terms of what i'm working working on um in addition to to doing the content for my site, which I'm very committed to doing. Um, I had a couple of, uh, uh, I guess it went in a couple of different directions over the last few years that I've, I think I've sorted out finally. So I thought I was gonna do a whole false flag book. That was my big, big thing for a while. And that can still happen, frankly. I have a tremendous amount of research on the history of false flags that I can and, and probably will turn into a book. But I decided I, maybe a year ago that I was going back full time into UFOs. And, and that means the third volume of UFOs in the national security state, which is a, a dreaded project that's been hanging over my head for a while, but I feel like I can do it now. And um, the only other thing, oh, pardon me. The only other thing that might get in the way of it is if I do a quick little 150 page book on the last two, three years of ufology, ufology turned upside down, which to me is a fascinating story. Um, but I may incorporate that into volume three of, of national security state, but that that's what I'm working on. I have just reorganized my main office, which was in a absolute state of disaster for the last year and a half. And I can work there and I can actually get some writing done. So that's my goal for 2020 is to focus as much on my writing as I can. Problem is frankly, um, it's a problem and it's not a problem. Like people invite me to speak at various places and do various things. And I enjoy those, but those take time out of my work. And, uh, it's, it's hard. I've actually, I've been turning a lot of events down because I have to stay home and I've got to be able to focus on my writing and my work. So I'm doing some travel, but hopefully not, not as much as I've done in the past. Well, we're counting on you to get in that office crank it out like yes, only, only you yeah. can do it. Richard, it's been an absolute delight, pleasure so much. Thank you so much for joining me and spending so much time with us. And uh, we'll stay in touch. I would do this again, just to let you know, I've enjoyed this uh, very much. It's a great conversation. So thank you for having me on, Alex. Thanks again to Richard Dolan for joining me on Skeptico. What a great guest. What an open and welcoming guy for someone who has done all he has done inside of this field. It's just amazing to talk to. So one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is toothpaste. Is toothpaste good or is toothpaste not good? If you remember from this interview, Richard's point, I think if I got it right, was squeezing that UFO disclosure toothpaste out of the tube is probably a good thing. And maybe we shouldn't come down so hard on those who are trying to do it. Or maybe we should consider all the aspects of what they're doing before we criticize them, as I sometimes do. 
So if you'd like to tee up that question with me and other folks who listen to this show, please join us over on the Skeptico Forum, which you can find all our shows there and you can talk to everybody about them. And you can also go to the Skeptico website, of course, and download any of these shows for free. No ads or firewalls, and you're free to share them around and redistribute them. The idea is really just to get this information out to people who need it. So if you know someone who needs to hear this information, please share the show with them. I have some great episodes of Skeptico coming up, I think. This one was terrific. Again, it's so cool to talk to a guy like Richard Dolan who can kind of go up to the big picture, but can also dive into the details. Great stuff. And I have some really terrific ones coming up too, I think. So please do stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care and bye for now. Mm -hmm.